So my wife has been wanting a BMW i3 for her primary car for quite some time now, but they're just too pricey and we haven't been able to afford one. But we managed to find this used 2014 model with only 3,000 miles on it for $25,000. So it's almost brand new and it's like we got it for half price. Okay, so I've decided to create the ultimate i3 review. Now, I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about cup holders or sun visors. I'll leave that to the professional reviewers, but I'm going to tell you about the stuff you really want to know. The BMW i3 comes in several different configurations. The first two are called BEVs, which stands for Battery Electric Vehicle. So these are pure electric vehicles. It comes with two battery sizes, the 60 amp hour version, which is rated at 82 miles, and the 94 amp hour version, which is rated at 114 miles. Then there is also the REX versions, which stands for Range Extender. These have a small two-cylinder motorcycle engine in the back for increased range. It's easy to identify a REX model because it will have a gas door on the front fender, where the BEV model will not. It is also available in both battery sizes and is rated at 72 and 97 miles respectively. The reason for the reduced range on the REX versions is due to the added weight and also because it needs to maintain a battery buffer when running on range extender. The Rex adds an additional 78 or 83 miles to these vehicles, giving them a total driving range of 150 or 180 miles respectively. Now, we managed to buy the Rex 60, and so that's the vehicle I'm going to be demonstrating in this episode. Now, you can't talk about a road trip in an electric vehicle without talking about the charging options. The i3 is pretty versatile. It can charge in three different ways. The first way is by using a standard wall outlet. You'll get about five miles of range for every hour of charging. Uh, so the full charge would take around 16 hours or basically forever. A level two charger makes a huge difference and you can expect around 25 miles per hour or about three hours for a full charge. The DC fast charger is even faster, although not all i3s support DC fast charge, and if you're buying a used one like we did, about the only way to tell is to open the charge door and see if it has these two extra prongs. This is also one big advantage of the i3 uh, over the Chevy Volt, as it does not support fast charging at all. If you read any opinions about the range extender on this car on the internet, you'll see quite a few different opinions. The Rex is only good for limping home at 40 miles per hour. That's not true. You can drive as far as you want at any speed. So the truth is actually somewhere in between, and that's what I'm going to show you today. The really frustrating part about this whole thing is that BMW purposely crippled the range extender for the US market. Now I'm not going to go into why because it's a long explanation, but uh, if you want to read about it, I'll put some information about that down in the description field. Now the first thing they did was to reduce the size of the gas tank. It's actually a 2.4 gallon tank, but the computer has been reprogrammed so that it can only use 1.9 gallons. So once the fuel reaches this level, the computer will insist that the car is out of gas even though it isn't. The other thing they did was to remove the hold mode, which I'll explain that later. But the good news is, is that it's fairly simple to get the car coded so that these options are reset back to the European configuration. Christopher Roberts from NTX Coding did RI3 for 150 bucks, and it took about a half hour. So these are all the different modules that are in the car, and it's going to go in and test each module. And it looks like we have zero, uh, zero fault codes. Two codes that you can program in. One is the tank... Um, the number of liters and the other one is the resistance of the sensor. And so we can change these here to be the not US version. And that's it. We can save the file and code it in. This gave us access to the full 2.4 gallon gas tank, uh, which bumped our total range up some and gave us the hold mode back as well. So in my Chevy Volt episode, I drove around Dallas-Fort Worth to test the range. Since the i3 is so different, I thought a longer trip was in order, so my wife has been wanting to visit Magnolia Market in Waco, Texas. Now, Waco is over 100 miles away from our home, so while not a cross-country trek, it's certainly a regional trip. If you look at a map of charging stations in the area, you'll notice there's almost nothing between Fort Worth and Waco. There's one station in Hillsboro and a couple of stations in Waco itself. And if you look for only the high-powered fast charging stations, there are zero such stations. 
And so we're going to be driving into what I would call an EV desert. So my wife loaded up the car and we also made sure to include the portable 120 volt charge cable in case we needed it. And so off we went. We drove 14 miles and decided to stop in Burleson, Texas. This is the southernmost fast charger of the Metroplex and our last charge before trying to cross this EV desert. We weren't here very long as it didn't take long to top off the battery. After we were done there, we stopped just right down the street at a gas station and topped off the 2.4 gallon tank in the car. But we also filled up a small 1 gallon gas can which fits really well in the frunk of the car. That holds enough fuel to give us an additional 40 miles or so of range if we need it. So between the car and the can, we bought just barely over 2 gallons of gas. So you can see the gas is full and the battery is almost full. So we left Burleson and Leslie's driving. Trust me, you won't get any hypermiling out of her. She drives the speed of traffic or faster. And remember that driving at this speed will drastically reduce the range you get on battery power. So traveling near 80 miles per hour, we started to leave civilization and the sun was starting to set. So we were definitely going to wind up driving in the dark. We decided to stop in Hillsboro and check out the charging station there. These are not fast chargers, so we did not charge here. We didn't want to sit here for like an hour just to get some meaningful amount of charge. But we thought we'd stop and have a look because if we did not have the range extender in the car, we would have to use these stations in order to make it to our destination. It appears at least one of them is broken, which is common with blink stations, That's they're always on the blink. So after leaving Hillsboro, it was dark and we were still heading out into the EV desert. We actually made it to around this point when our battery ran out and we switched over to the range extender. So we managed 62 miles of fast highway travel on a single charge. And if you include the charge we got in Burleson, then we've traveled 76 miles total on battery power. The range extender took us another 25 miles to our hotel. It would have been less, but we missed our exit and had to go a few miles out of our way. Fortunately, uh, this hotel was one of only two charging locations in the entire city of Waco and they had two Tesla destination chargers and one regular EV charger. So at this point we had 47 miles left of gas and no battery. We traveled a total of 101 miles from our house to the hotel. When we got up in the morning, of course the car was fully recharged. Leslie took this opportunity to clean the bugs off the windshield from the night before and we also accumulated quite a few bug guts on the front nose of the car, but we'd have to deal with those later. The thing that I find odd is that after recharging, the car now gives a reading of 88 miles on battery range, but for some reason the gas range jumped from 47 to 59. I realize both numbers are an estimate based on driving style, but I wouldn't expect any of those variables to change just from sitting in a parking lot overnight. Okay, so what would we have done had the charger not been available or been blocked by a gasoline car, which is unfortunately happens all too often, or just simply been broken? Well, uh, with this car, we would have had two alternatives. Uh, one, we could have used the 120 volt charger, which we brought with us and found a wall outlet somewhere on a pole or a wall or something to plug it into. Well, it is slow. It would have given a significant amount of charge overnight. Uh, the alternative is we could just use the range extender and uh, deal with any limitations there might be with that. So believe it or not, it might actually be possible to use one of these Tesla stations with an appropriate adapter because these are not superchargers. These are really just regular 240 volt chargers. They call them destination chargers. And there is an adapter you can buy that will allow you to use this on any electric vehicle. So when we left the hotel, we could finally see some of Waco and it's a much larger city than I thought. They even have a huge stadium and a big college. But um, I also ran across this Goodwill store quite by accident. Now the funny thing about this is I watch uh, Lazy Game reviews and how he goes thrifting in these Goodwill stores and finds all kinds of goodies. I do have some Goodwill stores around my place, but they're just full of clothes and dishes and other junk. But I thought, what the heck, let's just take a look. So there were of course racks full of junk as to be expected, but I did see these two things that caught my eye. I saw this keyboard by Fisher Price that actually appears to connect to a television and I was quite curious as to what it did and it was only 10 bucks, so what the heck. 
But I also found this vintage Casio keyboard for 10 bucks. And by the way, it amazes me how many people don't realize I have another channel called 8 Bit Keys where I feature these vintage musical electronic devices. So if you haven't seen that yet, check out the link in the description. Uh, I'm sure I'll eventually be doing episodes on both of these things I picked up. We also passed by the Dr. Pepper Museum, which is apparently the original birthplace of the soft drink. And there's even a museum where you can go inside and see the old bottling plant. Anyway, here's the Magnolia Market. This is what Leslie came to see, and she signed their guest book. But man, was this place crowded. And to be honest, I can't see what the appeal is of this place. There's nothing in here I'd want, even if it were free. But I guess I'm not the target customer. And there's no way we were going to wait in this line just to go to the bakery. Speaking of bakeries, we stopped at a Tesla supercharging station. Now, there's no way these stations will ever work with either of our electric vehicles, but it's still cool to see. And somebody's here charging up their Tesla. Uh, they put the station in Waco because it's a halfway point between Austin and Dallas, so it's a good place to recharge, and it's next to a Collins Street bakery, and guess what? There's no huge line here to wait in. So, on the way home, we decided to try out the new hold mode. That's one of the features that we got reinstated with the coating and uh, we got to see exactly how that works. So you can't actually engage it until you get below 75% state of charge. So you'll see the option is grayed out right now. But once you do, you can turn it on and the little two cylinder motorcycle engine will spring to life. Now when traveling at the speeds that we're going, the engine simply can't provide enough power to sustain that. But since the battery is still at 75%, uh, there's plenty of extra power for it to draw on. So uh, take a look at this screenshot and you'll see we have uh, 37 miles of gas and um, 53 miles left of battery. This little white arrow is supposed to indicate where you are holding the charge, but after driving at high speed for a while, you'll notice the gas drop to 4 miles, which is to be expected, but also the battery has lost some power as well, and that's because at 80 miles an hour, it has to pull just a little bit from the battery to sustain that speed. It actually felt a little weird being out in the middle of nowhere in an electric vehicle. I mean. We were still quite a long way from any civilization, however, um, we did stop at a Texas highway rest stop. I don't know about other states, but Texas has these things placed all down the interstates, usually in the middle of nowhere, and they have restrooms and a gazillion vending machines, but what they could really use are some EV chargers. Anyone in the Texas legislature listening to this? Uh, we need EV chargers at these places. Oh, and um, here's what the range extender sounds like when it's running. So uh, we ran out of gas around this point. Uh, we could have stopped and filled up from our little can, but it appeared we had enough EV range to make it all of the way home. So we just went straight there. We didn't even stop at the fast charger in Burleson. And we did make it home with 16 miles remaining. Since I have no use to keep a can of gas around the house, I went ahead and poured the gas into the car where we can use it some other time. So we drove over 200 miles in total for this trip. And uh, even if we had not been able to charge in Waco for whatever reason, um, we still could have made the trip back with just using the range extender. Although granted, our top speed might have been limited to maybe 70, 75 miles an hour, but that wouldn't have killed us. So one last thing, I did release an early copy of this video to some of my screeners, and it was pointed out to me that it's probably not a good idea to encourage people to put a tank of gas in the front of the car, because apparently it's part of the crumple zone of the car, and could be dangerous in an accident. Just thought I should point that out. Okay, so I should mention that if we had the i3 with the larger battery pack in it, we could have actually made this trip without using the range extender at all. Now, I will mention though that uh, Waco is probably about as far as I would ever wanna drive, at least here in Texas, without having a range extender because we do have such a limited charging infrastructure. So one obvious question that I should probably address is the Chevrolet Bolt EV. It's not on the market at the time of this video, but I think it will be the largest competitor to the i3 in the near term. With 238 miles of range, it could have made the whole trip to Waco and back on a single charge, and it will be cheaper than the i3. So believe it or not, we were actually waiting on the Bolt EV. That's actually what my wife wanted to buy, but uh, 
we came across this i3 at roughly half the price and we thought it was a good deal, so we bought that instead. And to be honest, even though the Bolt has a lot more EV range, there's still no way, at least today, that you can drive a Bolt EV from, say, Dallas to Houston. There's no charging infrastructure uh, between here and there, but we could do that with the uh, i3. So I will be doing a follow-up uh, or a part two of this episode where I'm going to take this i3 to the drag strip and race my Volt. So stick around for that. And then after that, it will be back to our regularly scheduled programming on vintage electronics. Stick around. Stick around.